This research methods and psychology video covers variables. The world is chaotic. Lots of things change or vary, and some things might directly cause other changes, but it's hard to see in all the chaos. In an experiment, researchers attempt to hold most variables the same, all while manipulating and measuring other variables. So let's talk about independent variables, dependent variables, covariables, extraneous and confounding variables. Psychboost.com, over 170 videos to help you with your qualification, and Patreon supporters can access bonus resources, tutorial videos, and the Discord channel. In correlational studies, researchers measure covariables. They take two measurements and then compare the measurements looking for relationships. These can be positive relationships, as one covariable increases, so does the other. Or negative, as one covariable goes up, the other one goes down. In correlational research, we can say two covariables are associated, but we can't say with covariables that a change in one cause a change in the other. It might be the other way around, or that a third variable is responsible for the change in both. In an experimental setup, a researcher will manipulate or change one variable. This manipulated variable is called the independent variable. So for example, the researcher might alter if the participant is given a drug or a placebo is given rewards for behaviour or in a control group without rewards, or is in green light or blue light. These levels of independent variable are the conditions of the experiment. The researcher will then measure any change in the dependent variable. That could be the reduction in symptoms, the production of behaviour, or recall. An important concept is operationalization. When stating the dependent variable, I need to specify exactly how it's being measured. So if I wanted to know how effective a course of, say, anger management therapy was, instead of saying reduction in anger, I might measure it by a reduction in the score on a questionnaire that measures hostility, or a reduction in the number of times a student has had a verbally aggressive outburst to teaching staff over, say, the next month. So that's the ideal. In an experiment, researchers can claim to have shown a causal relationship between the independent variable and the dependent variable. But of course, that's not all that's going on. There are other variables that can influence the dependent variable, and if these aren't controlled for, there won't have been an accurate measurement of the independent variable's influence on the dependent variable. We could then suggest that the study's findings are not true, because the researcher didn't set the study up in a way that controls for other explanations of the findings. Or in more scientific language, the study lacks internal validity. Extraneous variables. Extraneous variables are the name we give to any other variable other than the independent variable that could influence our measurement of the dependent variable. And there are lots of potential extraneous variables. For example, demand characteristics. These are cues that the participant picks up on that suggest how they should behave. This could be verbal or nonverbal communication from the researcher, and we'd call this experimenter effects. Or maybe it's the way the experiment is set up that gives away the aim. If the participant works out the aim, it's very tempting for them to act in a way that they think is helpful, or even unhelpful for the researcher. The problem is then that the researcher is measuring the effect of demand characteristics on the dependent variable, not the effect of the change in IV. Other examples are participant variables. Characteristics like age, gender and cultural background can influence behaviour, as well as any prior knowledge or skills related to the task. Situational variables are environmental factors that could influence performance, like any noise in the lab, maybe the temperature or visual displays. Order effects, so in a repeated measure design, practice or fatigue could be an additional variable. So you can imagine how these factors, especially if they vary significantly between the conditions, can influence the performance of participants. There's also a type of extraneous variable called a confounding variable. We would say that a confounding variable changes systematically with the levels of IV. Now this is a little trickier to explain, but imagine if you're going to do a study researching if vigorous body movement in some way influences making and recalling memories. You're hoping to see that when you move your body, your recall decreases compared to being still. If you get half your participants to learn a list of words for 5 minutes, and then recall while doing star jumps, and the other group to do the same task while still, well. If you don't have very fit participants, you've introduced an extra variable that changes systematically between the levels of IV. That confounding variable would be exhaustion. And it's not possible to separate the body movement from exhaustion. 
but the exhaustion is only in one condition, so it confounds your measurement of the dependent variable. The extraneous variables above, if not controlled for before the experiment, also become confounding, because now they change systematically between the levels of the independent variable. Control of extraneous variables. Researchers who want to claim their results are valid are going to want to take actions to deal with extraneous variables. To control for participant variables, we can use random allocation and match pairs. The reason independent groups design should always use random allocation between groups, if possible, is to control for participant variables. For example, pre-existing knowledge, skills or characteristics like age and gender. If you use randomization, you're likely to spread these variables out across the conditions. But you may still get unbalanced groups by chance. A better way to control participant variables is to run a match pairs design. This is carefully measuring a participant variable before the study and then matching the highest score in one group with the next highest in the other group. This will result in the participant variable being balanced between the groups. To control for order effects, we would use counterbalancing. As completing one condition first can change participants' performance in the second condition by giving them practice or making them tired, counterbalancing, splitting the sample of participants in half and getting each half to do one of the conditions first means any effect due to practice or fatigue is cancelled out because it's the same in both conditions. But importantly, while we can say we've controlled for order effects, we can't say that they've been eliminated. To control for situational variables, we use standardised procedures. Environmental effects such as the temperature, lighting or sound levels in the room can form part of a list called standardised procedures. This basically is a recipe the researcher needs to follow to give each participant the same experience, of course aside from the variation in the independent variable. So the researcher would then make sure the participants in each condition had the same experience. To control for demand characteristics and investigator effects, we can use single and double blind trials. So, to counter the participants changing their behaviour because they figured out the aim, well, the first thing you can do is not tell them the aim. That's a single blind trial. The participant is unaware of the true nature of the experiment. In order to stop the researcher influencing the results by, say, giving hints with their body language, so to limit investigator effects, we can use a double blind trial. Having the researcher who carries out the experiment be completely unaware of the true aims of the experiment. Carefully created standardised procedures with a script for the researcher to follow is also useful in both cases, reducing the chance of giving away the aim or the researcher using different language in each condition. We can use pilot studies and peer review to identify extraneous variables. Pilot studies and the aims of piloting is actually a separate bullet point in the AQA specification, but there isn't enough to justify a separate video, so I'll go into the depth you need here. A pilot study is simply a smaller version of the research study the researchers planned. And at its smaller, it's going to include fewer participants. But we can make improvements to the main study based on their experience in the pilot study. The aims of a pilot study, meaning the reason a researcher would want to use one, is it's a good way to spot extraneous variables and correct them before running the full-scale version. And you can probably guess that the things a well-designed pilot study would catch. Are the instructions to the participants understandable? Or do the instructions give away the aim? The same with questions that are used as part of the study. Are the standardised procedures working well? So do the participants in both conditions have the same experience, or was something missed? If the study is an observation, are the behavioural categories clearly operationalised? And running a pilot study might show other problems, like with the cost or issues raised by the participants such as not understanding the task or running out of time. Peer review is when you show your written up study to other scientists who are experts in your field and get feedback. This can be useful in identifying extraneous variables that you've missed, but at that stage the researcher might need to redo the study completely after dealing with the extraneous variables before they can then publish their study. I do have an entire video on peer review later in the video series and I'll go into this in a lot more depth. So that was variables. I have six tutorial videos covering the 2017, 18 and 19 AS and A-level research method sections. These videos have worked examples to every question and are full of exam tips. Patrons at the neuron level and above can access these and many more hours of exam tutorial videos as well as over 100 principal resources from across the A-level over on psychboost.com. I do want to thank all the students and teachers who have supported PsychBoost over on Patreon during the development of the Research Methods Unit.
It's their support that allows me to teach part-time so I can make Psych Boost on YouTube for everyone. I also want to give a special shout out to the patrons who support me at the developer level. So thanks to them, and I'll see you in the next Research Methods video, Ethics.